Well, I've uh, always worked on modern German history, 19th and 20th century, and I've worked in particular on the history of Nazi Germany. I produced uh, a book on the historiography of Nazi Germany in the 1980s and uh, a work on um, the Irving trial, which is a defamation action brought over and allegations of Holocaust denial. I was working on that in the late 1990s and then I produced a three-volume history of Nazi Germany in the years 2003 to 2008. Well, in the 1990s, following the fall of the Berlin Wall, the issue of reparations and restitution became very central to the way that we deal with the legacy of Nazi Germany. It's partly because there were a lot of claims for the restitution of property seized by the East German government after 1949, and partly because there were claims for compensation by Eastern European slave labourers in Nazi Germany who were now, with the fall of communism, able to make their claims. And so that led on in the 1990s to the issue of reparation and restitution in terms of artworks of one kind and another. And as the claims started to come in, the British government under Tony Blair felt it was necessary to set up a panel which would adjudicate on these claims, not in a legal sense, but in a moral sense, because legally the um, statutes of limitation mean that legal claims for almost all of these claims have expired. So that panel um, was constituted at the beginning of the present century uh, and it was set up with um, <clears throat> a number of uh, different experts. There was an art dealer, a philosopher to give us moral guidance, uh, as a former civil servant, there was a couple of lawyers, uh, and I was put on it as a historian. And it's called the Spoliation Panel because it's not just a case of the Gestapo coming into somebody's house and taking all the pictures off the walls and working away with them, though we have dealt with cases like that. But there are more subtle forms of looting as well. For example, forcing Jewish families to sell their artworks at an undervalue in the 1930s um, by imposing uh, extra tax burdens on them where they're not really justified, for example. I think it's worth considering that the uh, panel uh, is trying to make sense of events that happened, what now, sort of seven, uh, probably 70 years ago. And an expression which you'll often find in the panel's reports are the panel considered or took the view based on the balance of probabilities. So actually having someone who understands the sort of the events and the history and the laws of the time has been really, really helpful and has certainly helped the panel um, to, towards reaching a decision in, in, in many of their cases. It was initially expected that actually uh, nobody told us, or I might not have joined the panel, that there would be hundreds if not thousands of claims. And if that had been the case, then we'd have been working more or less full time. But in fact, there's only been a trickle, maybe a couple every year. And that, I think, has got a number of reasons. Firstly, there's a huge restitution action at the end of the Second World War, led by the famous Monuments Men, the Museum and, and Fine Arts um, uh, Authority in the American Army, with British involvement in that. And that restored thousands and thousands of artworks to their original owners. And then... Very often the trail has gone cold after more than half a century. The evidence is very thin. Um, where the evidence is extremely strong, it was usually restitution at the end of the Second World War by the early 1950s. And then, of course, many families were murdered. Then, of course, many families were murdered uh, in Auschwitz and, and elsewhere, and there's simply nobody left to claim the artwork. So I think for all these reasons, uh, there was a, a, a long period of um, inactivity in, in the field and in fact it only began again with a much greater interest that's been in the Holocaust in the 1990s with films like Spielberg's Schindler's List for example um, and a great deal of publicity given to these issues. In the case of the Coronation of the Virgin oil sketch, Sir Richard Evans was able to offer some very helpful insights um, for the benefit of the panel. The issue before the panel at the time was whether the debts that had been uh, um, incurred by the owner, which led to the sale of his art collection, had been fabricated, whether they were, un they were fabricated tax demands, 
by the by the Nazi authorities, or whether there were they were as, as a result of bad bad investments, and Sir Richard Evans' knowledge of the sort of developments in the German banking system at that time, the financial crisis in I think 1931 and 32 and the sort of general Aryanization of the banking system at that time and how that um, affected the employees and directors in the banks because I, I seem to remember the, uh, this, this person lost their job as well yep. and I remember there was some comparison of how those policies had impacted on other organisations and banks at the time and Richard Evans um, understanding of the, as I say, of the history of what was happening in Germany at that time was instrumental in allowing the panel to reach its sort of very firm and clear conclusion. This oil sketch by Peter Paul Rubens was made for the Jesuit church in Antwerp um, in a series of paintings um, on the ceiling depicting the Old and New Testament. It was made um, sometime before 1613 and it represents an initial um, sketch for um, the coronation of the Virgin and one can see its octagonal shape um, reflecting the frame that it would have. The ceiling paintings were um, perished in a fire in the 18th century and so these sketches become all the more important in the history of that commission. The Samuel Courtauld Trust referred um, the claim um, for restitution of the Coronation of the Virgin to the Spoliation Advisory Panel um, and it was um, not the first time the Court Samuel Courtauld Trust uh, referred a case to the panel and in this particular case the facts of the story were so extraordinarily complex and had to do with banking history in the 1930s before the arrival of the Nazis as well as through in relation to the Dresdner Bank and the um, the head of the Dresdner Bank who was in fact the former owner of this painting and on the face of it the case appeared um, rather condemning, but uh, upon a great uh, deal of research and forensic examination by um, an expert witness who um, the Samuel Courtauld Trust employed to um, look into the facts of the story and in um, thanks to the panel's um, openness in um, enabling the dialogue and the conversation, um, the dialogue between the claimants and ourselves, this allowed for a very full discussion um, to come out and um, it is obviously thanks to the panel's um, recommendation that the Samuel Cordell Trust uh, was able to keep this work in its collection and um, put it on display for the public. Well, we also had a very unusual claim, which was from the Archbishop of Benevento, which is in southern Italy, not far from Naples, for the return of a, a missal that's a um, 12th century manuscript written in a rather beautiful script called Beneventum Mini School, so it has a very close association with the, with the area. And this uh, was in the British Library, formerly in the British Museum before it, the two were split. And it was purchased uh, just after the end of the war from a British officer. So it wasn't actually owned by a Jewish family, it was owned by uh, an Italian monastery. Uh, and it wasn't taken by the Nazis, it was taken by a British officer. And so we um, decided in the end that because the terms of reference of the panel simply referred to the Nazi era, we had to deal with this. And after a great deal of um, investigation and debate and a, an oral hearing, we decided that it had uh, been in the possession of the monastery in 1944. It had most likely literally fallen off the back of a lorry as they piled all their possessions onto lorries and drove away uh, while the fighting was coming up uh, Italy towards them. And um, it found its way into a Naples bookshop where it was bought by a British Army officer and um, sent by post to Britain. And he then offered it to the British Museum. And crucially, really, the British Museum wrote to him saying they suspected it had been looted uh, and couldn't accept it directly um, from him. But uh, they uh, 
said that he should offer it for auction through a reputable house like Sotheby's or Christie's, and um, they then felt able to purchase it themselves. So they had a very, very strong feeling that it was uh, looted, and we concluded that that was correct. Following a private member's bill in Parliament, the uh, Holocaust Return of Cultural Objects Act was introduced and became an Act of Parliament in 2009, which allowed all national museums, including, including the British Library, to return items where this followed a recommendation by the panel and ministers agreed. So in fact, I think it was in 2010, the British Library um, referred the case back to the panel um, and because the panel had sort of considered this before and the conclusion was quite clear, the, um, using that Act of Parliament, the missile was returned to, um, to Italy. And that was the, the Beneventon missile was the first item returned under the Holocaust Return of Cultural Objects Act. Okay. So we decided that we wanted to put forward a bill which would enable us to recommend restitution and that recommendation to be followed, rather than institutions saying, well, we'd love to, but we can't do it because of our statutes. Um, so we drew up a sort of rough shopping list of what we wanted, and then it went into the civil service, and the um, drafting, uh, it, it went into the civil service for drafting, and they, of course, came up with all sorts of possible problems that the legislation might lead to, which in the end didn't seem to be insuperable. One problem was that uh, we tried to put it on to a government bill, just to tack it on as a clause, it was quite frequently done. But first of all, uh, there, was, there were timetabling problems. The government legislative program is always subject to alterations if very urgent things come in and so on. So um, it was very uncertain and we wanted to do this fairly quickly. And then secondly, um, you can amend government bills and the Elgin Marbles lobby got hold of this and said they would amend it so to include um, the Elgin Marbles, go right back to the early 19th century. And the government was very um, keen to avoid that. So uh, we found a private member, and you can't amend private members' bills, so we found a private member who put it forward um, as his own. And of course, once it was put forward, it was very plain, plain sailing. It was a fairly short bill. Um, which simply said that on the recommendation of the Spoliation Advisory Panel, uh, institutions may return cultural objects. It didn't force them to, but the moral pressure is quite, quite substantial. Uh, so it would be a very brave institution, perhaps foolhardy one, that said, no, they're not going to.